Okay, so let's talk about the Romanesque. The Romanesque is a time that sort of is a product of the early medieval times. Um, what happens is that once the Roman Empire falls, there are many people who come in and try to rule the area that was the Roman Empire. And those people that come in and try to rule that area that was the empire, which we just studied, were like the Franks, the Visigoths, the um, Merovingians, the Hiberno-Saxons. They're all the indigenous people within those areas or within Northern Europe. Um, they come in and try to take over since the Roman Empire has fallen. And some of them are successful, just like the Franks were successful in um, settling in France. That's why France is named France. Um, the people in the Scandinavian area settle in those areas. But the thing that really sets the ball rolling is that a group of... Muslim people decide that they are going to try to conquer all of North Africa and the southern part of Spain, and they want to run at taking over the Roman Empire as well. And so the Crusades are launched. The Crusades were wars that were um, where the sole purpose was to spread Christianity through the area. Um, and then the Ottoman Empire is trying to conquer as well. So now we have a religious war, the Christians against the Islamics. Um, it's a situation that really doesn't have anything to do with religion. It has to do with the want to have natural resources. And so um, eventually the Ottoman Turks are able to conquer the southern spot part of Spain. And they conquer all of the upper part of North Africa. Remember, that those upper areas in North Africa um, control trade. And the Umayyad Empire knows it. I'm sorry, the Ottoman Empire knows it. Um, the Umayyads came before the Ottomans. So, point being that we now have a war for the control of the Roman Empire with a religious backdrop. Okay, so I went ahead and tried to kind of break down the Romanesque era of art history for you in these basic um, historical background and uh, stylistic features. So historical background wise, the Romanesque starts at about 1000 and goes to about 1200 AD. Um, the Crusades bring a new need for larger churches and churches began competing for business. Artistic hallmarks or stylistic features of the Romanesque. Um, we talk about the stylistic features in terms of sculpture. I'll add architecture to this and then manuscript illumination. Um, sculpture takes on the form of relics, uh, ivory le relief carvings, and religious objects. Uh, they are heavily encrusted with precious jewels. Um, sometimes they include spoya. Spoya is when you take something that was precious from one culture and do something new with it, um, which is also syncretism, but spoya is specifically um, taking something from like, like, say, a Roman culture, like a Roman head, and then making it new by putting gold on it and making it a relic. We'll talk about that. I'll give you an example. Um, the form of the relic takes on the shape of the body part inside the relic, and I will show you many examples of that. And for manuscript illumination, um, there's a heavy emphasis on line work that recalls the Roman love for wet drapery in classical antiquity. 
Okay, so those are your basics. I'll keep adding to this list. You keep adding to the list so that you get a good, solid picture of what Romanesque art is. So as I mentioned, the Ottoman Empire kind of goes on a warpath for claiming land. They want to claim the land that the Roman Empire um, has lost control of. And so they start with the lands in the east and um, northern Africa. They're getting ready to make their way up through Europe when they're stopped in their tracks after they conquer the lower half of Spain. Probably because the Roman Empire was strongest where its central nucleus was, which was Rome. Um, so it was easier, if you remember right, the Roman Empire had a very difficult time taking hold of or controlling the um, entire empire because it was so large. They have a communication problem and they have a security problem. They can't possibly watch that amount of land and that amount of um, space. And so because of that, the control over Constantinople plus the drive and desire to control Constantinople in terms of ports was so great that they lost it. Um, as well as they're getting ready to lose Europe to the Ottoman Empire. Now, had the Ottoman Empire succeeded, you and I today would not be Christian. We would be Islamic. So the other thing I want to tell you is that in the lands in the north, where we see the art of the indigenous people blend with the Christian art, the indigenous people have settled and taken hold of areas like France and Germany. And in doing so, they've um, they've created art that is regional. We talked about that in the medievals, but also they created um, strong cities. They're strong enough to keep a hold of the area that they control now. And so because of this, the Ottoman Empire runs up against a war. How do they um, keep a hold of it? Through pilgrimage routes. The whole point of the pilgrimage routes was to win back Spain. So they start in France and they go into Spain. There's one main route in Spain. The route is decided by the churches that they go to. So they just connect the churches and go from one church to another. The church not only supports the soldiers, but other people go on the pilgrimage as well. Um, it's not like we sent out the US military to go along the pilgrimage routes. The Crusades were an organized group of men. Um, they weren't an official military group. And so because of that, most of the people who decide that they're going on a crusade have some sort of, um, some of them just have a desire to spread Christianity. They believe in their faith. They believe in it so strongly that they want Christianity to spread. Others of them have personal life crisis. Um, I've been trying to have a baby for years and my wife can't get pregnant. So I'm going to go on a crusade and due to my piety, God will reward us and give us a child. Um, there are ways to be pious along the children, pilgrimage routes, and we'll talk about that. Um, but the idea of going on the pilgrimage wins favor to God in their eyes. And so because of this, um, you get people who go on the pilgrimage routes and donate large amounts of money to the churches. And so the churches begin competing for financial donations. Um, 
But let me give you a little bit of like background in term of in terms of power. So the Romanesque successors of the Etonians were the Salians. Uh, the Salians were Frankish, and they ruled the empire that corresponds to present-day Germany. And they ruled the Lombard region of Italy. Like their predecessors, the Salian emperors were important patrons of art and architecture. Although, as elsewhere in the Roman Empire, or in Romanesque Europe, the monasteries remain the great centers of artistic production. So where we see in the monasteries produce art is in manuscript illumination. Okay, so the first thing I wanna explain is what is a relic and So this is the reliquary statue of Saint Foy. Um, it was done in the late 10th century, early 11th century. Um, Bernard of Angers was the first to have written about Saint Foy, and he said, It is not an impure idol that receives the worship of an oracle or of sacrifice. It is a pious memorial, before which the faithful hearts feel more easily and more strongly touched by solemnity and implores more fervently the powerful intersector of the saint for its sins. What's he talking about there? He is trying to justify why they venerate Saint Foy. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about the reliquary in general. It has a wooden interior covered by gold, silver gilt, and jewels. Gilt is the thing that they use to apply the jewels with, it's the solder. Um, it is 33 and a half inches tall, so it's just over three feet tall, and it contains the remains of St. Foy. Um, it uses spolia, and we talked a little bit about what spolia is, and I will add that to the slide here for vocabulary. Um, spolia is the repurposing of a material, in this case a Roman material, to create a new material. How is this different? Okay, so hold on, let me back up. The spolia, specifically in St. Foy, is the head. The head was a um, head from a Roman sculpture. And so they take the head from the Roman sculpture, they repurpose it, and use it to um, create the reliquary. What is the difference between spolia and syncretism? Syncretism could simply be a copy of the way um, the Romans created a statue. It's not actually taking a Roman thing and creating a new sculpture out of it. So spolia is the act of taking the actual object and making it a new object in a new era. I hope that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, you can reach out to me and I will discuss it with you further. Um, okay. Pilgrims went to receive a blessing uh, on the pilgrimage routes. Their visitation demonstrated piety. And this is why whenever they were having some sort of major life crisis, um, the community felt that if they went on a crusade, that it would bring good, um, not necessarily luck, but good favor upon you by God. And so, um, yeah, a lot of people went on the Crusades for that reason. The reliquary of Saint Foy is located in Conquis, France. Um, it's on the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. Many churches in the pilgrimage route had similar or identical layout to manage uh, throughout and the church was also an abbey so here i'm talking about the church that the reliquary of saint foy was dedicated to saint foy was a um local martyr she was burnt at the stake i believe and burnt for being a christian and so she's 
locally famous in her area and they've taken her remains and put them in this reliquary. Um, the church that St. Foy is in has been there since the 600s but was rebuilt in about 1050. So I don't have pictures of the church for you anymore. It does not stand any longer, uh, but I am gonna to explain to you how the relic, or how the reliquaries functioned within the church um, so that you can get a good idea of how the crusades and the reliquaries and the architecture all work together. This is the floor, floor print of a typical pilgrimage church. So the pilgrimage church had a aisle called the ambulatory, and you can see it, it's sort of grayed out here in my slide. Um, the ambulatory was the area that is highlighted in blue. Um, this particular image doesn't show you where the ambulatory goes all the way around the church. Um, but the pilgrim's plan would be to arrive at the church, walk into the church, walk around to the church, and exit. As they walked into the church, they would venerate the um, reliquaries. The reliquaries were kept in these radiating chapels that are um, these little uh, half circle shapes that are at the edges of the building. Um, they are highlighted in red. So you see that the church becomes a very important part of the pilgrimage routes. In addition to, the church has realized that they are a very important part of the pilgrimage routes, and they know that as the crusades go on, people will come um, to their church to see their reliquaries, but also to donate to the church. So just like we've talked about all the way back into um, prehistoric art, we see that um, the act of paying homage to something includes a donation. So if you go into a Catholic church today, you pay a quarter, you light a candle, you say a prayer, the candle stays lit, your prayer stays alive and going to heaven. Um, people believe that reliquaries had extreme power. And so they would go from one church to another, paying homage to the reliquary and giving to the church. Um, it was looked at a pi as a pious act and therefore would bring good fortune to the family. The reliquaries often had stories of miraculous um, intervention. St. Foy was one that had stories of miraculous intervention. They say when you look at St. Foy, you have a portal to heaven through her eyes. They People feel when they visit her as if she is looking at them. Um, the reliquary in the Catholic belief system is one that is an intercessor between the living world and the heavenly world. And so reliquaries are very important, but churches also become very important in terms of architecture. The architecture changes to accommodate the pilgrimage routes. It changes to accommodate the pilgrimage. It changes to gain monetary benefit from the pilgrimages. Okay, so the other thing that we can see about this church, just by looking at the floor plan, is how the piers work. So you see that there are large piers at all corners of the church. So here where the transept meets the nave, you have two large piers um, and large piers in the exterior walls that carry the weight of the wall. This was a accomplishment that we looked at last lecture in the churches, in the early medieval churches. They figured out that if they're going to build a big church, they have to have a massive pier 
in order to keep the church standing upright. The larger you go in terms of height, the more the wall wants to lean outward. And so they have a problem. They're building the church so big that they've got to figure out how their architecture, 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 architectural structure sorry, works all together. Um, typically, a Romanesque church has large, chunky walls. Um, the decorations, because the church is so large and chunky, tend to be chunky. They have an ambulatory and radiating chapels. This is the Church of St. Serenin. Um, it began its life as an abbey and was named after um, St. Saturn, Saturna, Saturninus. Um, he was a saint that was martyred in the third century um, by Roman prosecution for um, being Christian. And so um, the building is named after him. It is the largest Romanesque style church in Europe. And you can see that its exterior has a very plain looking um, facade. It does undulate more into the viewer's space, which means the building builds out into the viewer's space, especially on the right and left sides of the building. That's that new pier system that they're using to create strong, thick, chunky walls. Uh, you see the entrance here in the front of the building, that's the narthex, um, and the double portal doors uh, that we're going to break down here a little bit later in this presentation. Um, you see the transept, that's that arm that sticks out towards the back, and then the um, spire that sits at the transept crossing. It has a um, two-level nave elevation and a clare story. Here is a view of the church in Toulouse from a bird's eye view. You can see from the top the um, radiating chapels. They're along the apse of the church. Okay, so here I'm trying to show you the different parts of the architecture for the church. Uh, the ambulatory is indicated in the diagram on the left as the sur or row, the aisle that goes all the way around the church. I know it's a little funny looking at the apps at our time getting the line to turn properly. At any rate, you can see that the line enters the church where it says ambulatory goes all the way around the church and back out the other side. That ambulatory was named the ambulatory because people were expected to ambulate in it. Ambulate is the Latin word for walk. So people would walk in the one side, go all the way around the church and back out the other side. Um, the radiating chapels are where the reliquaries were kept. And so it was important that they had an aisle that went all the way around the church from the entrance to the exit so that they could get so the pilgrims could get to the radiating chapels. The radiating chapels held the reliquaries to venerate. Then I labeled the transept for you. Um, it's that short arm of the church. And then I labeled the transept crossing. The transept crossing is where the nave and the transept meet. The nave is the aisle that goes down the center of the church all the way to the apse 
where service takes place. And then the transept is the short arm of the church. So I will actually label those for you as well. Um, so you can see that the church has many parts. Um, they all have fancy architectural names and they're kind of important for you to be able to refer to. So if this is confusing to you, I would print this particular slide out and just have it available so that as I'm talking about the churches, you can follow along. So in the very first slide, I showed you some pilgrimage routes. These um, are the crusade routes. They're the routes in which um, they weren't stopping at the pilgrimage churches, they were just uh, fighting routes. So I just wanted you to see them, um, to know that there were more than just one set of routes. All right, so here, just like I just got done explaining to you all the different parts of the church itself, um, the doors also have special parts. Um, the one that you would be expected to remember is the half moon circle at the top here, um, at the very center with Jesus on it. That is called the tympanum. And then the area uh, between the two doors is called the tremo. Those two places are the places we're primarily going to see sculpture and art in the church. Actually, I misspoke. What I meant to say is those are the two primary places that you're going to see art on the door of the church. So this is the church of... Um St. Pierre and Moissac, France. You can see if you look really close, the building next to the church uh, is used as an outdoor cafe. When you go to um, Europe, those outdoor cafes are really, really common. Uh, but the thing that we're gonna really look at here today is the South Portal, which is the, um, the door, the South Door at the Church of St. Pierre in Moissac, France. So this is a close-up of the portal, um, at Sa the South Portal at St. Pierre in Moissac. You can see here the um, relief sculpture that is above the lintel in the doorway. That relief sculpture is the common place for relief sculpture in a Romanesque church. Um, you also see the tympanum. The tympanum is the post that supports the lintel. Remember back from early on when we learned about post and lintel construction, um, the post that supports the lintel is also very typical of a Romanesque church. The tympanum sculptures tended to be sculptures that were um, illustrations from the Book of Revelation. They took on two forms, really. Um, this form, that was sort of a uh, esoteric viewpoint of the Last Judgment and the Second Coming of Christ. And then the other um, common subject matter was the judging of the souls from the Book of Revelation. So they're really focused on the Book of the Revelation, and they tend to preach to the people who are going on the pilgrimage routes to come into the church. They do they use scare tactics to do that um, by showing the passerby what happens if you don't follow Christ. Um, this particular church houses the remains of St. James Major. It was on the route um, to an important church in Spain. Um, the Spanish church that it was on the route to was one of the most important pilgrimage sites in Western Europe. Um, and St. Pierre and Moissac was a popular stop for those who were making this long journey to Spain. It represents an esoteric concept of the second coming of Christ and the end time.
Here is a close-up of the portal. You see Christ in the center. Behind his head is a cruciform halo. And if you look really closely, you can see the mandorla behind him. To his right and left are beasts that represent the gospel writers. Matthew is in the upper left, represented by a winged man. Mark is below, shown as a lion. Luke is on the bottom right and is seen as the ox. And John the Evangelist um, as the tetramorph. These were common Christian symbols of the evangelist writers. The representation of the four evangelists... Um, were very common in scripture, in painting, in manuscript illuminations. On the other side of the evangel evangelical writers are two tall, elegant angel angels that hold scrolls. There are also 24 elders mentioned in the text of Revelations. Um, they're arranged around the evangel evangelist writers and the angels so the 24 elders are all those people that surround jesus and the evangelist writers everything directs our attention towards the center and you can see that jesus wears these elongated robes that um hint at the very linear patterns that were created by wet drapery in the classical era. So this is the Tremo. The Tremo has three pairs of intertwined lions and lionesses. Um, they were there to symbolically guard the entry into the church. Um, on the east side of the Tremo is a representation of the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah holds a scroll in his hands, and on the west side is a figure of St. Paul from the New Testament. This pairing of the Old Testament prophets with the New Testament prophets was very common in relig religious imagery during the Romanesque era. You can see the way that the artist um, treats the body in this elongated fashion. Excuse me, even the lions are so elongated that they almost seem like skins and not really lions. The elongation um, complements the gracefulness of the post, as well as you can see how the clothes are treated in this beautiful, sweeping, graceful motion, um, emphasizing the elongation of the um, tremor. Here's the close-up of the weighing of the souls. You can see the linear treatment that they use to describe the way the body moves underneath the fabric. Um, again, that is very common Romanesque um, treatment of fabric and sculpture. You can see the souls being weighed and the angels weighing them as well. Um, if the soul is too heavy, it goes to the demon's pile. If it's light enough, it gets handed up through the angels to the right hand of God. Um, you can see at the bottom here, there is a row of Latin lettering. That's a callback to the Roman era of the um, triumphal arches, in which it describes something that uh, is important about the sculpture. This tradition of weighing the souls is not a Christian tradition. This is syncretism. The very first time we saw the weighing of the souls, it was an Egyptian mythological legend. Remember, we looked at the um, Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and Horus was weighing the soul, and the soul had to be as light as the feather. 
All right, so now you've seen the two major Romanesque era style tympanum sculptures that were aimed at people trying to get them to come into the church. So now I want to ask you what answer you came up with for me as to why the church was trying so hard to get the people to come inside. And I hope you came up with the answer. It was about money. They want people to come inside their church. And so there's a new competition for the bitter, bigger, better, best relic. The relics that were most highly prized were those that claimed to have a bit of the robe of Mary or a tear of Mary or a drop of Jesus's blood um, or the crown of thorns, the shroud that he was wrapped in. We've all heard of the Shroud of Turin. Um, and so those churches that claimed to have those things were highly sought after in the pilgrimage routes, as well as um, those churches usually were the ones that made enough money um, to make those bitter, bigger, better relics, fun, bigger, better churches, bigger, better um, tympanum sculptures. It all has to be paid for. And that's how the church is paying for it. There were three really important women in the Middle Ages. Romanesque Europe is a man's world, um, but women could and did often have some power and influence. This is Countess Matilda of Canessa. Um, she ruled Tuscany after 1069, and she was the sole heiress of vast holdings in Northern Italy. She was the key figure in political struggle between the popes and the German emperors who controlled Lombard region. Uh, she had just a really um, unrelent unrelentless dedication to re helping resolve the split between the German and the Italian rulers. Um, and she defended Pope Gregory's reforms, who would have been from the Lombard region, and after her death, she wills most of her lands to the papacy. This is important because the land that she owned was part of where St. Peter's is today. A more famous and more powerful woman was Eleanor of Aquitaine. She was wife of Henry II of England, and she married Henry after an annulment of her first marriage to King Louis VII who was king of France. She was queen of France for 15 years and queen of England for 35 years. During that time, she bores three daughters and five sons. Two of them become kings, Richard I, who was also called Richard the Lionhearted, and John. She prompted her sons to rebel against their father, and so Henry imprisons her. Um, she's released at Henry's death and lives on as Dowager Queen managing England's government and King John's holdings in France. Um, the very last woman that was very remarkable in the Romanesque time was Hildegard of Benin. Um, she was the most prominent nun of the 12th century and one of the greatest religious figures of the Middle Ages. Hildegard was born into an aristocratic family. Um, the family owned large estates in the German Rhineland. At a very early age, she began having visions. And when she was eight, her parents decided a monastery was the best place for her to be. Um, they placed her in a Benedictine monastery, which meant it had monks and nuns. She becomes a nun at the age of 15. And she says that in 1141, God has instructed her to disclose her visions to the world. Before that time, she revealed them only to close confidence at the monastery. Um, one of these was a monk named Hildegard. Oh, I'm sorry. One of these was a monk that Hildegard chose to dictate her visions to him. Um, Eventually, she trusted Archbishop Heinrich of Mainz, and he endorses her visions as being from God. Uh, he writes a letter to a Cistercian Pope, and the Pope formally authorizes Hildegard in the name of Christ 
and St. Peter to publish all that she had learned from the Holy Spirit. And so Hildegard becomes the abbess of a new covenant or a new convent um, built for her near Benin. As reports of Hildegard's vision spread, kings and popes and barons and other really important members of the community go to seek her counsel. All of them were attracted by her spiritual insight into the truth of the mysteries of the Christian faith. Um, in addition, her visionary works uh, were, in addition, in, in addition to her visionary works, she wrote scientific treaties or treatises. Um, one was about physics, one was about medicine. She also composed music and she wrote the lyrics of 77 songs, which appeared in a book called Symphonia. She was the most famous Romanesque nun. When we look at the manuscript illumination depicting Hildegard, you see these octopus style tentacles coming down to the top of her head. Um, they are a representation of God's hands coming to her head to give her a vision. Um, she holds in her lap a diviner's bowl, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. Her feet sit on a stool, indicating that she is of holy um, endorsement. And the image that you see her in is very Romanesque in that the architecture is thick and chunky. Um, it's simple. It's not highly decorative, um, but has some pattern to it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this divination bowl. Oh, well, and I forgot to mention the clothing. You can see how the clothing drapes and folds along the body, um, revealing what the body looks like underneath the clothes. Uh, it's done so in a linear way without a lot of value variation. And so it's hard to see like how deep the wrinkles are in the robes, uh, but you do see a nice linear pattern going on. Okay, so about the divination. Um, basically, the only way I can explain this to you is to describe to you the way divination works in Africa. So if you uh, go to a diviner in Africa, oftentimes the diviner will say, okay, I will read what um, the spirits have for me to relate to you. And so he'll take a tray. Um, in this case, Hildegard looks like maybe she's got water and maybe some oil, but um, typically an African diviner takes a sacred tray and dumps beans and rice onto it. And he'll uh, sit back and look at the pattern and how the beans lay. And he'll say something broad to the person who's seeking divination. He'll say something like, when the cock crows three times and you see a full moon go underneath the belly of the mountain, then you will know whether or not you'll have a baby. God's word will speak. Um, <laughs> which seems very foreign to us, but um, some, I, I don't want to say sometimes. I've had many African students tell me that, yes, that happens in their home country. Um, I mostly know about art from West Africa, so um, I know about art from West Africa and a little bit about Central Africa. So that's my divination story. It's the best way I can explain to you how divination works. Basically, she's got a bowl, she's got a substance and a stick, and she's reading to the person who's coming for advice something about the pattern in the bowl and the stick. The thing I think that is really interesting is that this particular process if it were in the modern day, or maybe in the 1800s, they would have called Hildegard a witch. But because it's, it's a divine inspiration for God, uh, now they endorse it and say it's a vision by Jesus himself. Okay, so this is the initial R fighting the dragon. Um, I was really excited when I started looking at this because I realized it was from Sateau, France. Just so happened that my wife and I went to Europe oh, a couple years ago and um, she went to the monastery that this 
particular manuscript illumination was um, made in. Uh, it was done in 1115 to 1125. That's a 10 year span. It took 10 years to paint this manuscript illumination. Um, it is a little over 13 inches by eight inches. So about the size of a piece of notebook paper. And you can see this heavy reliance on the bordering if you think all the way back to the time of Justinian, they loved these heavy borderings on mosaics and in manuscripts illuminations. So that is definitely a throwback to classical antiquity. You can see the linear fashion in which the body is drawn to represent fabric. Um, However, the anatomy of the knight fighting the dragon becomes very um, plain to see when you see the breast, um, oh, the chest muscles, the pectoral muscles. You also see um, this dragon that's in the shape of an R. Now, I tried to do some research on this and figure out what the dragon symbolized. And I really did not get to come up with a whole heck of a lot. Uh, but what I did find was that possibly the dragon could represent the um, fight that the monks faced with their faith. Uh, you can see that the dragon's wing um, forms the lower letter R, or the lower part of the letter R, and the knight's shield and the knight himself forms the um, vertical part of the letter R. A really beautiful drawing uh, or manuscript illumination. It was done on vellum uh, with tempera and ink. This is the baptismal font from Belgium done by Rainer of Huey. It is rare that we know the artist that did these Romanesque pieces and we got lucky enough to know who did this particular work of art. It is from Belgium and this area in particular specializes in metalworking. Um, it is likely stamped or signed with Rainer of Huey's um, um, trademark and that's how we know that Rainer of Huey was the one who was the designer of this baptismal font. Um, the font has a cover over the top and water would be held in it, water that was blessed and part of baptismal ceremonies. Um, the oxen at the bottom represent the 12 disciples in the center, you see Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist and the dove that's come out of the sky to um, say that he is pleased with Jesus. Mary stands to his left, offering him a towel from the baptism. Um, and this thing that Jesus stands in is actually a river. Uh, you have to look really close to get the idea that it's a river because it kind of looks like a dress, almost like a wedding dress if you um, were looking quickly. Um, but I promise you it's a representation of a river. It has lots of wavy lines um, because Jesus was baptized in a river. Um, the plant-like material that you see, the trees are very natural looking. Um, and everybody else wears robes that are draped across the body, um, very much a throwback to classical antiquity, as well as if you look really close, you can see Roman lettering uh, in Latin behind Jesus um, telling this story of the baptism of Jesus. Uh, let's see, Rainer of Huey was actually from the Moose River Valley in Belgium. Uh, it was originally made for Notre Dame in Liège. 
And um, now it remains in uh, a church in Beldum, Belgium. This is the head reliquary of St. Alexander from the Abbey Church of Stavlot in Belgium. Um, it was done in 1145. Guess what is in that reliquary? You got it. It's a head. Um, you can see that the box is heavily decorated with jewels and different images from the church. Um, it would have been a head reliquary that was a little bit more um, versatile in that it could be used for any particular worship time. Some of the reliquaries are more specialized and are to honor a specific time of year, but this one is um, a broader time of year because it encompasses many of the religious um, symbols. Also, you can see that it's a lot um, less encrusted with jewels than what we started with in the medieval era at the beginning of this unit. Um, the medi early medieval work was highly jeweled, had tons and tons of ornamentation. Um, the Romanesque has less ornamentation, um, and the Etonian sort of bridge between the Romanesque and the early Middle Ages. It's definitely incorporated um, some precious metal, uh, including the hair, and uh, all the jewels would have been precious gems. Uh, the feet of the box are angels, and um, I believe his hair is made of gold. This is the cathedral at Pisa. Um, Italian architect architecture is typical in that um, there is a baptistry that is separate from the church, as well as a separate bell tower. Um, as we get into the Gothic, you'll find that English churches look one way, French churches look another. This one is in the Italian design. Um, most Italian baptistries are separate from the church, as well as the bell tower. It is a church done in the basilica style, in the Roman cross style. Um, and this is the part of Italy where ancient Roman and early Christian heritage is strong. Um, Romanist architects designed the building and were for the most part structurally less experimental than those built in Germany and Lombardy. Um, the cathedral's freestanding um, and the baptistry was used to baptize infants and initiate converts into the Christian community. Uh, the cathedral and St. Mark's in Venice were begun in the same year, in 1063. The thing that's really interesting about this church, and I've been to it, um, there are lots of really interesting things. The um, marble that's used for the flooring inside the church is just stunning. It's breathtakingly beautiful. In fact, I found myself taking pictures of the floor a lot. Um, there were lots of different stones brought into the Roman Empire and um, the Christian builders saw, found it acceptable to tear apart the old Roman monuments because they were dedicated to the pagan myths that um, the Romans believed in at that time. And so they would repurpose these materials in the churches. Um, the exterior of the church is made of granite or marble. The interior of the church is made of marble and granite as well. It has a three part, uh, at least a three part nave elevation. And at the transept crossing, you see a small dome. Um, when I was there, I got to see a very interesting video about the restoration of the bell tower, which took place in 2008. Um, when it was originally built, see, these things took a long time to build. It was begun in 1063 and wasn't finished until 1153. So you're looking at a span of about a hundred years almost. Well... A little bit a little bit more than a hundred years oh no I'm sorry a little bit shy of a hundred years 
obviously math isn't my strong suit. Um, at any rate, <laughs> um, when they started the bell tower, it took quite some time to finish. And the soil in this area is made of uh, sandy um, materials and shell. And so when they started it, they built it on a foundation that had settled. And when the foundation settled, the tower began to lean. By 2008, it leaned over by 15 feet, and they were very concerned that the tower was going to collapse. And so because of that, they went about reinforcing the bell tower by digging underneath it and... Um, reinforcing the base of the bell tower sort of like you um do when a house's foundation is fall, uh, is sinking you go in and reinforce the um foundation with steel beams so that's what they did they reinforced it from the bottom um made the 15 feet lean uh more like six feet and reopened it as safe for the public it's a tourist spot in that lots of people come to see the Leaning Tower at Pisa um, and you see everybody like holding their hands out in this like sloped way to pretend that they're the ones holding up the tower. Um, but what I would tell you is the interior of the church is just breathtakingly beautiful. Here is the interior. There is a famous pulpit that was sculpted by... Um, Nikolai Pisano there in the front. You can see that the barrel vaults and the groin vaults were used um, at the transept crossing. And then you see the three-part nave elevation, the side aisles, double side aisles, um, with the Corinthian Roman columns and the repeating um, barrel vault in the colonnade. At the top, you have a clear story and a ceiling made of coffer with coffers. Um, this is one of those churches that is just magnificent inside in terms of its size. It's really large, um, really breathtaking. And the um, marble that's used is highly decorative. You can also see the um, dark and light patterning underneath the arch as well as in the second arcade um once again that pattern was taken from islam okay this is a manuscript illumination done by master hugo it's moses expounding the law from folio 94 recto of the burberry bible from saint edmund's england um once again, let's talk about the Romanesque features of this manuscript illumination. You can see the heavy patterned border that goes completely around the manuscript illumination. Um, it is divided into two scenes. The first scene is Moses receiving the Ten Commandments from the burning bush. The second is Moses explaining the Ten Commandments to the people. You can see that the artist uses a very linear treatment when discussing or when communicating how the body lays underneath the fabric, um, especially in the bottom illustration. You can see that even more so. Moses is indicated by the um, person that stands in the center with the horns. I don't know if you remember. No, that was a different lecture. Um, Moses has horns. Uh, due to a mistranslation of the King James Bible, uh, the King James Bible, I believe, was preferred by Constantine, and um, the uh, horns were from a mistranslation. Poor old Moses gets stuck with horns, and still today, if you see a sculpture or an image of a religious image and a person has horns, that's typically Moses. Um, you can see the purple ink in the background. Remember that purple ink is uh, very expensive to come by. It's made by snails from Asia. And then you see the beautiful blue tones in the robes and in the um, border of this particular manuscript illumination. 
Last but not least, probably my favorite of all of the Romanesque um, works of art is the Bayou Tapestry. Uh, in the Delve Deeper activities, there is a segment from the BBC on the Bayou Tapestry. What I would tell you is that that segment is something we would have watched in class had we gotten to meet face to face. This um, particular work of art is a really breathtaking work of art. It's made of linen um, and the image is embroidered or sewn into the linen on top of what is on top of the fabric. Um, there are really two types of tapestries, one in which the image is um, woven into the tapestry by changing the variation of the thread that's part of the tapestry. Another way is to have a linen tapestry in which a picture is sewn onto the um, tapestry. This one is the picture is sewn onto the tapestry. You can see the Roman love for border at the top um, and the Roman um, lettering at the top. Uh, this segment is the one in which, I believe William the Conqueror is killed. Um, the Bayou Tapestry is 20 inches high and 230 feet long. So it's absolutely impossible for me to show you the whole thing. Now, when you watch the BBC video, you'll see the entire thing and they'll narrate the whole thing for you so you know what's going on in the story. Um, the tapestry was designed or woven on a loom and then needle workers were the ones who sewed the images on top. Um, we don't know whether the needle workers were Norman or whether they were English women. Um, they used eight different colors and two types of stitches. There were real and imaginary animals sewn in. It has a continuous frieze-like pictorial narrative. And a crucial moment in this narrative was when the Norman defeat the Anglo-Saxons at the Battle of Hastings. The entire tapestry tells the story of the Battle of Hastings. Um, this united all of England and much of France under one rule. The Dukes of Normandy become the kings of England, and um, it was commissioned by a bishop named Bishop Odo. He was the half-brother of the conquering Duke William. Uh, the embroidery may have been sewn in the Norman court. We just aren't sure. Many art historians, though, believe it was the work of English stitchers in Kent uh, where Odo was Earl after the Norman Conquest. Odo donates the work to the Bayou Cathedral, hence its nickname, the Bayou Th Tapestry. Um, but it, it's uncertain whether it was originally intended for display in the church or someplace else. Um, in 1066, Edward the Confessor, uh, who is the Anglo-Saxon King of England, dies. The Normans believe that Edward had recognized William of Normandy as his rightful heir, but the crown ended up going to Harold, who was an Earl of Wessex, um, the king's Anglo-Saxon brother-in-law. Uh, he had sworn allegiance to William, and so the Normans felt betrayed. They were descendants of the seafaring Vikings and boarded their ships and crossed the English Channel and crushed Harold's forces. Hence the end of the Bayou Tapestry's story. I highly encourage you to do that delve deeper activity. It really is a fascinating activity.